Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Good morning. If, if we were in Montenegro, we would say, Dobro jutro. Can you guys say that? Dobro jutro. That was all right, guys. Um, I'm really thankful to be here. Thanks to Pastor Brandon for inviting me last a few days ago to speak to the youth and Pastor Ryan for letting me share this morning. My family wishes they could be here, and they're actually watching online because their ride to church fell through today, so hey, family. Um, yeah, I have a beautiful wife. Can we show my family? Her name's Jessie. She was called to missions in middle school. You can clap, yeah. And then we got three kids, and all three of our kids were born in different countries. It's something I would not recommend. Jesse would definitely not recommend that. Uh, but our son Oliver is six. He was born in the magical state of Delaware in Wilmington. Was anyone here born at St. Francis? No, I guess, all right, all right. Then Nora, she's four years old, and Lily, she's two. Um, but they send their greetings and their love. So four years ago, we arrived in Montenegro. And as I said in the video, Montenegro is the most unreached country in Europe. And I say that not in the sense that some countries are unreached, like in the Middle East and the far corners of the earth, where people have absolutely never heard the name of Jesus. Those places still exist. But Montenegro is unreached because the gospel that they have been presented, the Christianity they have been presented, is a Christianity of power and violence. That even over the last few decades, um, the, the Christians and the Orthodox Church have killed people in the name of Jesus and used the cross in a symbol of their violence. So when I say unreached, I don't mean that they've never heard of Jesus, but the Jesus that they have heard is not the Jesus of the, of the Bible and the Gospels. And so there's just a handful of born-again believers. We were the first Assemblies of God missionaries there. And um, the Montenegrins would never go into a, a Protestant evangelical church, never. Their families wouldn't allow it. They would never be caught dead in it. In fact, the church that we attended didn't even have a sign out front that it was a church because of vandalism. So we had to go to them. And really, that's every believer's job anyways. In the States, we can get pretty comfortable and just say, well, I'll invite my friend to church and then kind of let the church do all the talking. But really, we've been called to go to people, no matter what country we're in, no matter what society we're in. And so one of the ways that we would um, start conversations with people is, I, I like to do photography, so I'd have a camera. And we would go, uh, whether, you know, throughout the city that we lived in, or we'd pack up our family into our car, our speed of the light car, and we'd go up to the villages and the mountains. And we'd introduce ourselves as saying, hey, we're here writing about the people and culture in Montenegro. And we created an Instagram account called Faces of Montenegro, where you can read people's stories. And, um, and we just heard their hearts. You know, who are these people? What type of life have they lived? And we'd allow the Holy Spirit to guide us in those conversations. And a lot of those conversations, we ended up being able to steer to have spiritual conversations. Conversations about Jesus, conversations about what happens to us after we die. And so the Lord was able to use that to just open up doors that, ha that would have been closed. Uh, and they ended up inviting us into their homes We'd be able to go back to those villages and they'd remember us and they'd introduce us to their friends and we were able to translate these gospel comics and get them printed that we could leave with them because the majority of these villages and cities had absolutely zero born again believers. So like their chance of encountering Jesus is extremely low. I'm not gonna say zero because I believe God gives visions and dreams and there's the internet, uh, but the, the reality is there's very, very little access to the gospel. While we were there, we were able to found and start an NGO that we called Putamida, which means Road to Peace. And through that NGO, any worker who comes to work with us will be able to get a visa, will be able to register churches through the government, through the NGO, as churches are planted. And as I said in the video, the biggest need was for there to be workers. And I'm proud to say that before coming back to the United States, two other families arrived in Montenegro to live there long-term to continue the work that got started. 
So let's praise the Lord. How about we clap for that, yeah? Um, and our goal when we came back to the States was to go back to Montenegro and continue the work. Um, but through a long story, we felt the Lord redirect our path to go to Spain. And in Spain is also a country that uh, the church and religion has been consumed with power and in the past violence as well. And so most people have rejected anything to do with God or the church. But we believe that through Jesus, there's hope. We believe that through Jesus, there's resurrection life. And so our goal there will be to just continue in discipleship type ministry, working with the local churches, discipling new believers, and seeing the church grow that way. This morning, I have a, a message from the Lord. And as I said, first service, you know, the Spirit of God in the beginning of time, the Spirit spoke, and out of nothing, the universe came into existence. That's pretty awesome. And it's that same Spirit who spoke at the beginning of time that I believe wants to speak to us this morning. And I say that because I'm going to read from Scripture, and the Scripture is God's Word, and so I know God is going to speak. And if that same spirit of God who spoke and the universe came into existence out of nothing speaks this morning, I believe it's wisest for us to listen and for us to respond. Because we'd be foolish to hear the spirit of God speak and not do anything. So I'm just saying that up front so you know that at the end, you'll be given a chance to respond. And you're going to be able to respond in your pew, so you don't even have to come forward. But I want to make sure you have the opportunity, with whatever the Lord speaks to you, to respond to him this morning, even before you go home. This morning, I'm going to read from Luke chapter 1, verses 76 to 79. And in Luke chapter 1, we, the characters are Zechariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And, you know, they were both very old. Elizabeth had... Uh, been barren her whole life, and now she was past the age of being able to get pregnant, and an angel appears to Zachariah, says, hey, you're going to have a baby. And disbelief, right? How can my, you know, his wife, who is advanced in years and was barren even when she could have had babies, how is she going to have a baby, right? But through a miracle, God gives them a baby, and they name him John, John the Baptist. And so the passage we're going to read is when Zechariah starts to speak again for the first time after hearing that he was going to have a son, and he, he prophesies over Jesus and his son, John the Baptist. And that's what we're going to be reading this morning. And so John the Baptist, his, his main task that he had was to prepare the way for Jesus, right? That was his whole ministry, was to prepare, to prepare the Israelites, the Hebrew people, for Jesus. And I believe in a very similar way, our task as followers of Jesus is to do the same thing. Our task is to prepare the way for Jesus. And so even though this prophecy is talking about John the Baptist, I believe that we can hold on to this prophecy as well since we have a similar task as John. In verse 76, it says this, it says, and you child talking about John, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the dawn will break upon us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace." So this is John's task. And in a way, this is describing what the gospel is. We've all heard the word gospel, right? And the word gospel in Greek means good news. So there's a lot of thing that encompasses the gospel. It's not just these verses, you know. You, whole books have been written about this. But we know that whatever the gospel is, it has to be good news. If it's not good news, it's not the gospel. And so here again, he's talking about John and how he's going to prepare the way for the Lord. In verse 77, he says this. You will prepare his ways to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. The gospel is good news 
because we can be forgiven from our sins. That's good news. Our sin controls us and our sin separates us from God. So the fact that we can actually be forgiven from our sins is the greatest news that there can be. How many of you have been hurt deeply by someone you care for? You know, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's someone at work, a close friend that you trusted who betrayed you. You know, maybe it's someone in church that you really honored and respected and you felt uh, betrayed by them. When we're hurt and we hold on to that bitterness and that anger and that frustration and we choose not to forgive, that starts to control our hearts. It starts to control our life. You know, when we allow pridefulness to enter into our hearts and we start to, to believe that we are better than other people because of the job that we have or because of the color of our skin or because of our faith, when we allow that pride into our hearts, it starts to control our thoughts, it starts to control our life and it fills us with this spiritual death. When we first arrived in Montenegro, we went out to coffee with uh, a local Montenegrin. And in that conversation, he said something that's stayed with me this whole time. He said, to be Montenegrin, to not forgive. Because Montenegro has gone through war after war, is hundreds of years, all they've known is betrayal and war. And so they hold on to that anger and they hold on to that bitterness. And they believe that holding on to that anger and bitterness, you know, they retain that power. They can believe that forgiveness and letting go and not holding it against them is a weakness. And I would think most of us in here wouldn't describe ourselves in that same way. But I think realistically, we're very similar to the Montenegrins. We might not find, find our pridefulness in not forgiving. We might not make that a characteristic of who we are as a people, but the truth is we are not quick to forgive. I speak from experience. Man, I've been hurt deeply. I've held on to that bitterness and it feels good and it feels like we're in control but we're not. That bitterness and that unforgiveness is what controls us. But the gospel is good news because we can be forgiven from our sins. That's why Jesus came 2,000 years ago. Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus taught the way that we should live to glorify God. Man, Jesus even did miracles. He gave sight to the blind and the lame walked and the physically dead came to life. But even Jesus who had done no wrong was betrayed by one of his closest friends and he was wrongfully accused and he was crucified. He was crucified because of our sinfulness. We are the reason that Jesus died on the cross. Our sinfulness was placed on Jesus. Our unforgiveness, our anger, our bitterness, our pridefulness, our selfishness, our lust was placed on Jesus on the cross. And the love that we see Jesus portray on the cross is a love of unconditional forgiveness and unconditional embrace. Even on the cross as Jesus is suffering the punishment for our sins, He's suffering the, the punishment for Judas's sin of betraying him. And on the cross, Jesus looks at the people in the eyes and he says, Father, forgive them. And Jesus says that it's with that same forgiveness that we have received that we must give. In fact, he says, the amount that you forgive is the amount that God will forgive you. It's of utmost importance as followers of Jesus that we forgive those who sin against us. The gospel is good news because we can be forgiven from our sins. 
we no longer have to be controlled by our sinfulness. We no longer have to hold on to that bitterness. Why? Because we have been forgiven and the Spirit gives us that strength to be able to forgive. It's not by our own strength that we can forgive someone who's betrayed us, but it's that strength that we get through Jesus and his death and resurrection on the cross. The following verse goes on to say in 78, because of our God's tender mercy, the dawn will break upon us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Man, what an image. The gospel is good news because it brings light to those who are in darkness. Spiritual darkness is a theme in the Bible from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of Revelation. Right? Spiritual darkness is where there is no hope. Spiritual darkness is where you don't feel the presence of God, you don't hear the voice of God. Spiritual darkness is where sin runs rampant. Because in darkness, you think that no one can see you. And so the things that we do in darkness are evil because we think we're not being seen. But the gospel is good news because it brings light to those who are in darkness. We had a good friend in Montenegro whose name was Lazar, which in English, his name would be Lazarus. And he was born in Podgorica, the capital city, grew up in an Orthodox family, and as a young adult, he ended up becoming addicted to drugs. And if you know anyone who's been addicted to drugs, or if you have yourself, you know that drug addiction destroys the person's life, and it destroys your relationships, and it destroys the trust that you have, even with your own family. And so that was his life, completely controlled by his sinfulness and his drug addiction, completely broke the relationships that he had. He lost all the trust that he had. And for years, this was the life he lived, completely hopeless. Until one day, he was uh, admitted into a Christian drug rehab center, center, uh, center across the border in a country called Croatia. And in this drug rehab center, he would hear the gospel every day because it was run by born-again believers. And he talks about how for months he would hear it, but nothing would penetrate his heart. Nothing would penetrate his mind. Because he had been in this spiritual darkness from the moment he was born. But he talks about how one day the light started to break through the darkness. As he continued to hear the story of Jesus and how Jesus could set you free from your sinfulness, he started to see a glimmer of hope where he had never seen hope. He started to feel the presence of God when he had never actually felt the presence of God and he started to hear the, he, hear the Spirit's voice where he had never heard the Spirit's voice. And he had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was completely set free. Because the gospel is good news because it brings light to those who are in darkness and it forgives those who have sinned. And so he had a complete transformation. Not only was he set free from his drug addiction, but he was set free from his sinfulness. And so now he is one of the local believers, the most vocal local believer in his faith. Because he's encountered the resurrection Christ who transforms lives and brings light to those who are in darkness. And so every day he's in the community through his work and he's sharing with people his testimony, how he was once in darkness, but now he's in light, how he was once spiritually dead, but now he's alive. And as he, you know, he graduated this program and he went back home, he hadn't seen his family in a while. And again, those broken relationships because of his addiction with drugs. And imagine the welcome he had coming home, you know, life completely transformed, set free, and his family being, you know, hurt from his, his addiction. So you'd think that his family was there with open arms saying, welcome home, son, right? Like the prodigal son. But in reality, his family said, we wish you'd go back to your life of drugs and for you to follow Jesus. Because a people who have been in spiritual darkness for so long, that light is something that repulses them. 
I don't know if you've ever been in a really dark room or you've been in a cave and all of a sudden someone turns on the light, right? Our first response is to cover our eyes and close, and close our eyes because the light in that first few seconds is not a pleasant thing. And that's the reality of so many people who've been in spiritual darkness their whole lives. But the gospel is good news because it brings light to those who are in darkness. The gospel is good news because it brings forgiveness of our sins. And I'm going to read the last part of verse 79, and it says, And he will guide our feet into the way of peace. The gospel is good news because it leads us to the way of peace. So it's good news because we can be forgiven from our sins. It's good news because it brings light to those who are in darkness. And it's good news because it guides us to the path of peace. One of the days that I was out with my camera and I was walking through the city, I was walking into a city park and my prayer in my heart was, Lord, lead me to who you want me to talk to. And, um, and so as soon as I saw these two young men on a bench, I just felt in my heart, you're supposed to go talk to those guys. And um, I don't know if the Lord's ever spoken to you like that, where you just feel in your heart, I need to talk to, some, talk to this person. It can be really difficult to obey. Um, it doesn't matter what country you're in. It can be really difficult to obey. And there's been times where I've, I've suppressed that spirit's voice. And I said, actually, I'm not comfortable doing that. But you know, that wouldn't make for a good story on Sunday morning. So in this story, I did obey God. But I want you to know that it can be really difficult. It always is worth it in the end, even if you feel like a fool. So I walk up to these two guys, teenagers, maybe 17 years old, still in high school. I introduce myself, and we had an amazing conversation. You know, they were so talkative, sharing about their life and what they loved about Montenegro. And uh, before I left, I'd already taken their, their portraits. I asked one of the kids, his name was Jovan, and I said, Jovan, what is it that you want in your life? So 16 or 17 years old, I'm a stranger foreigner. You know, he doesn't know me. But he responded to me and he said, I want to find peace. And he talked about how he wanted to find peace in his heart, but he also wanted to see peace in his culture, in his society. And he told me how he had been searching for peace in Eastern meditation, but hadn't found peace. But the gospel is good news because it leads us to the path of peace. And biblical peace, you know, is so comprehensive. Biblical peace does not mean just the absence of conflict. Biblical peace is taking something that's broken and mending it to make it whole. A lot of times that's in relationships, right? Broken relationships. And Jesus was our example of how we could be peacemakers. Right? Jesus in the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are the peacemakers. And he says, why are they blessed? Because they will be children of God. What a beautiful thing. Uh, it makes me think of, can we have my, the picture of my family again? Um, you know, my son Oliver, he looks a lot like me. You know, you, it's hard to see him here because he's hiding in the back. But if you saw us together, you'd say, oh yeah, there's no doubt. They're related. You know, growing up, I grew up in Spain, and I have light skin for Spain, and blonde, I used to have blonde hair, which in Spain they don't have, you know. So people would meet, meet our family, and I had two sisters as well, and they'd always tell my dad, wow, your, your children are legitimate. Um, you know, there was no doubt in their mind that we were related to my father because we had semblance. You know, we resembled each other. And so that's what Jesus is saying in the Beatitude. We will be known as children of God because we will reflect God's character when we are peacemakers. Not when we run away from conflict, not when we, we break relationships with people, but when God uses us 
to be peacemakers. And so Jesus is inviting you this morning to be a peacemaker. That same unconditional forgiveness that Jesus had even on the cross for those who were sinning against him is the same unconditional forgiveness that he's asking us to have for those who have hurt us. As Christians, we shouldn't have enemies, right? Because we're told our enemies are spiritual. Our enemies are not flesh and blood. The Russians are not our enemies. The Taliban are not our enemies. Jesus is calling us to unconditional forgiveness, unconditional embrace, even with people we do not like, even with people who rub us the wrong way, even with people who believe differently from us. We are called to be peacemakers and we will reflect the heart of God when we walk in peace. I, I, I have the personality where I, I like to be right. If I'm in a conversation, in a discussion with you, I have a really hard time admitting I'm wrong. Um, and there's not much good about that type of personality. But Jesus isn't calling us to always be right in the sense of an argument. He's calling us to unconditional love. It doesn't matter whether you vehemently disagree with Republicans or Democrats. He's calling you to unconditional love unconditional forgiveness and unconditional embrace. It doesn't matter what the person's religion is. He's calling you to unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness, unconditional embrace. That's how we will be known as children of God because that is God's heart. And that doesn't mean that we ignore sinfulness. That was point number one today. The good news of the gospel is that we can be forgiven from our sins. The gospel is good news because it will bring light to those who are in darkness and the gospel is good news because it leads us to the path of peace. Not where we run away from conflict, but where we run to conflict and being empowered by the spirit. We mend what is broken and make new something. That's what Jesus is encouraging you and inviting you to follow him in today. As a church, we often are not known as peacemakers. But Jesus is saying that's the heart of God. Jesus is the son of God and he reflected that heart even on the cross. And we are the children of God. And we get to reflect God's heart through reconciliation and unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness and unconditional embrace. So I'm gonna have a stand up this morning. This is our chance to respond. I believe God has spoken because we've read his word, Luke chapter one. I don't know how you need to respond because I don't know specifically what God has spoken to you. But we learned today that the gospel is good news because it brings forgiveness from our sins. So as you look at your hearts this morning, you might see that you are controlled by your sinfulness. Maybe you're holding on to that bitterness from someone who hurt you and betrayed you. Maybe you're holding on to anger, selfishness, pride, lust. That sinfulness is controlling you. You are not controlling that sinfulness. My encouragement for you this morning is to call out to Jesus because Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross offers you forgiveness from your sins so you no longer have to be controlled by your sinfulness. And so you can also forgive. So maybe that's how you need to respond this morning. Or maybe you say, actually, I came here this morning and I know I'm in church and I know the worship was incredible, but I feel so distant from God. Maybe you've never felt the presence of God, even though you're here this morning, or maybe you're going through a season where you you feel so far from God and you're filled with that hopelessness and you can't remember the last time you heard God speak to you. There were large chunks of time in Montenegro where I felt that spiritual darkness so strong that I didn't feel the presence of God and didn't hear the Lord's voice. But out of obedience, I kept moving forward. The gospel is good news this morning for you because he brings light to those who are in darkness. You don't have to leave church this morning in darkness. 
you can call out to Jesus and ask for that light to shine down upon you. And maybe as you look at your heart, you say, you know what? I've not lived a life of peace and I've not lived a life of peacemaking. I hold on, you know, I, I like to be right in my arguments. I don't like my neighbor because of, I don't know. There's a lot of reasons not to like our neighbors. But Jesus is calling you this morning to be a peacemaker, to be filled with unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness, unconditional embrace. Just like Jesus on the cross. There's no more beautiful picture than even on the cross, Jesus forgiving us when we're the reason he's dying that wretched death. So your response might be, God, lead me to the road to peace. Lead me to those relationships that are broken. Maybe a relationship that you have that's been broken in your family, at work, in the community, or maybe that God wants to take you to another relationship in the community that's broken with the people who have, you know, individuals or a people group who have been kept on the fringes of society. And he's wanting you to be the peacemaker. Being filled with the Spirit of God. There's nothing you can do in your own strength, right? But being filled with the Spirit of God, following the road to peace. And so I'm going to conclude this in prayer, but as I pray, I want to encourage you to use your own words to respond to God how you see fit. I don't want us to leave the same as when we came in. And that's not saying that we weren't great people when we came in. But Jesus is calling us to a deeper relationship with him. So Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you sent Jesus to earth, that he lived that perfect life, that he exemplified to us how we should live with unconditional forgiveness and unconditional embrace. Lord, I thank you that we can be forgiven from our sins, that we no longer have to be controlled by our bitterness, by our anger, by our selfishness, by our pridefulness, by our lust, but that we can be set free because of Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. Lord, I pray for those here this morning who they say, man, I'm in this spiritual darkness that you're talking about. I have no hope. I don't feel the presence of God. I don't hear his voice. Lord, I pray for those this morning in that spiritual darkness, that just like your promise in, Ezekiel, or in, in Luke chapter 1 says, that light would shine down on those who are in darkness in the valley of death. We pray for everyone this morning who is in that darkness would experience a glimmer of hope with light shining down on them. And Lord, I pray for those who want to follow that road to peace, who want to be blessed for being peacemakers because they are made in the image of God. Lord, we cannot be peacemakers in our own strength. We absolutely need the Spirit to empower us to not win an argument or run away from confrontation, but to go into where relationships are broken, where there is strife and where people are are outcasted and be used to mend, to make new and to embrace those who have never felt the presence of God, who have never felt the love of God. So continue to guide us into the path of peace. We'll show our appreciation to Ben, our missionary here today. <clears throat> wow. He didn't say amen yet because we're going to pray over him real quick. Amen. And we're going to pray uh, for him and his journey and his family for the next four years. And something we said, that was a challenging but much needed word right now. And something we said in the first service was, that to also be a peacekeeper or not to be the reason for conflict, but to be someone who brings peace into a situation. So there's a lot of conflict and tension in our world right now. As believers, we don't need to add to it. 
We need to be peacekeepers, peacemakers, show love and show the way. And you were saying, and it's, we've seen it on the news, that Ukrainians and even Russian believers are trying to keep peace right now in, in their country. So, wow, something to really chew on and for us to live out and apply in our lives today. So thank you for that challenging word. And uh, we're so grateful for you. Uh, they are on their way soon to Spain. And so we're going to pray over them. And if you'd like to give a gift um, today, you can do that with the envelopes in the pews, or you can go online on, on our PushPay app, and you'll see a, um, a field where you can click down and pick him uh, and their family to get them there. We already started supporting them a couple of weeks ago, but we want to help them stay there for four years. So anything we can do to help uh, above our ties this week would be great. And so let's pray a blessing over you. Can you extend hands out to where you are or where you are to him? God, thank you for the box, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the season that they were in in Montenegro, Lord. God, thank you for the seeds planted. Lord, the rocks removed of that hard ground and and now, God, fertile soil, Lord, so that the seeds can grow, Lord. So we pray for a fruit to rise up there, Lord. I pray that he would hear stories of your seed, your gospel, the good news, taking root in people's lives. Bless him with those stories, Lord God, in the days to come. Lord, provide for his family in every single way, financially, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Lord, we, he needs more of you, God. They need more of you, Lord. They need your help, God. Lord, we thank you that they have said yes to be a worker in the, la- in the fields, Lord, and to labor in the fields, God. So, Lord, as they go, we commit to go with them right here in prayer and in giving. And, Lord, may they be encouraged today. And, God, thank you for the word. Many things we can apply in our lives. God, help us to be doers of your word today. May it transform our lives into salvation and to be more like Christ. We thank you, God, for calling some home today. Thank you, God, that your light pierces into the darkness. And at first, it may feel uncomfortable, but you love us. And you're saving us from eternal darkness. So we thank you for that, God. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And we give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.